Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord our God on this beautiful Sabbath morning. And as we begin this morning, a few announcements uh, today. First of all, I want to uh, give uh, an update on the Christmas care baskets. Just as a reminder, uh, next Sunday, uh, December 20th, immediately after worship, uh, the plan is, is to fill the fruit, goodies, and cards in seven baskets uh, for our sick and shut-in members. Uh, just as a reminder, for the eighth basket, uh, Mr. Garland's basket has to be pre-filled and pre-packaged and, uh, and all that, but we're welcoming and inviting y'all to write cards and drop those off for Mr. Garland uh, to get put in that basket. So just uh, make sure to have all that stuff uh, down in the fellowship hall before worship uh, next uh, Lord's Day. And uh, again, uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, just see uh, or talk to uh, Miss Karen. Uh, also uh, in the uh, announcements in the bulletin, uh, today we will have our annual uh, stated congregational meeting after worship today. Uh, just as a uh, uh, kind of housekeeping note on that front, um, to have a quorum for our congregation meeting, we need to have 25% of membership present and two elders. So we have about 105 on the rolls here at Bethany. So that means we need about 25 or 26 uh, folks uh, in person uh, to have a quorum. And so uh, please, if you are a member here, um, just by counting noses, <laughs> please, uh, if you can, uh, stay after worship today uh, for our congregation meeting. Uh, now, on that front, in your bulletin is the agenda for the meeting. And again, just as a housekeeping note, uh, at a stated meeting like this, we can only take up business that is on the agenda. Uh, and uh, so if, if, if you had wanted something to put on there, I uh, apologize, it's uh, too late for that. Uh, we have the agenda before us and it's in your bulletin. And uh, again, we will take that business. And as you see, there is nothing this year that is of, uh, uh, of uh, time taking uh, matter. Uh, pretty routine stuff that we do every year. But again, we do ask y'all to, to stay for that meeting after worship today. Also, uh, in uh, the bulletin, just as a reminder, we'll have our prayer meeting night, 5 o'clock. Continue to go through the book of Joshua and uh, uh, take a look at all the other uh, matters in there. Uh, before we begin worship today, one prayer request. Uh, please be in prayer uh, for Miss Winifred Callister. Uh, they had to take her to the uh, hospital this morning. And uh, I'll be in prayer for Miss Winifred and, and Mr. Robert and the Callister uh, family. And let us uh, prepare to worship the Lord as we do so in a moment of silence. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes to us in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. As we hear from the word of the Lord, as he calls us together on this blessed Lord's Day, let us hear from this first chapter of the epistle of James, beginning there at verse 16. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. And to remember the good gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his birth and of his death and of his resurrection on this first day of the week. 
Let us return our thanksgivings for the gospel and for his good love by standing together and singing a Bible song number 288, Wholehearted Praise, Psalm 138. Let us stand, let us sing together. the God who has given unto us the blessings of his grace. Let us now come before the Lord our God once more as we return unto him and hear from our God his call to worship and prayer. Let us pray. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, the God who is our strong tower, who is our ever-present help in a day of need, Unto you we come this morning, lifting up our voices unto the heavens, praising your majesty and of the future blessings that you have bestowed upon us in the heavens themselves. For dear God, when we gather together on this day with our brothers and our sisters in Christ, we are testifying that our faith is not in this present evil world. Dear God, we receive a foretaste of that glory divine. We are preparing ourselves for that celestial city. Dear God, may our hearts and our souls and our minds be focused upon the glory that is the heavens. For that is our true home. And that is our place of comfort and peace. And we who reside in the Lord Jesus Christ, we who have the Holy Spirit within us, know by the assurance of your promise that that is our home and that we are pilgrims on the way. And to God, we pray in your mercy as we rejoice in these things that we now turn on to the words that your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
As we hear once more uh, from God's holy and perfect word, we turn uh, to the book of uh, 2 Samuel. As we turn to chapter uh, 17, and as we read uh, verses uh, 1 uh, through 15, I apologize for the uh, typo in the bulletin. That's what happens when I do the bulletin. Uh, we turn there again to 2 Samuel. And again, let us turn there uh, to chapter 17, beginning there at verse 1. <clears throat> Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he was weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. Then I will bring back all the people to you. When all return except the man whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also. Let us hear what he says too. When Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. So Hushai said to Absalom, The advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. For said Hushai, You know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and that they are enraged in their minds like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. And your father is a man of war, I'm not camp with his people. Surely by now he is hidden in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at the first that whoever hears it will say, there is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore I advise that all Israel be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, that the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in person, so that we will come upon him in some place where he may be found, and we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. Moreover, if he is withdrawn into a city, that all Israel shall bring ropes to that city, and we will pull it into the river until there is not one small stone found there. So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel, to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. Amen. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy and his perfect word. Let us now be seated. I invite the children to come forward uh, again for the lesson. Well, good morning, y'all. How are y'all doing today? Good. Good. Did y'all enjoy this blast of hot air we got this morning? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, the weatherman tells me it ain't going to stick around for very long, so uh, <laughs> let's enjoy uh, this warmth that we have today. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you all ever stayed in a tent? Yes. No. No. Yes. No? You've never stayed in a tent? Why, why do you stay in tents? So they could protect you? Well, they could protect you, right? Well, camping. Yeah, for camping, right? Now, how many of y'all have been camping? What do you go camping for? Get, get s'mores. Get s'mores, fun. right? Go outside, you know, fun. have fun. What do you do on camping trips? Roast marshmallows. Roast marshmallows. Jump in the lake. <laughs> you jump in the lake, play games. All right, y'all are focused on food this morning, y'all. We must not have got a big breakfast. <laughs> um, well, right, we go out and we do these things, right? Now, how many of us live in tents all the time? Mm. None of us, right? Yeah, Shh, that's what I tell everybody. <laughs> what I say. Now, why don't we live in tents all the time? Because we, we have houses, right? Because we have houses to live in, right? And, right, houses are what we would call permanent structures, right? That's our main residence. Now, in the Old Testament, we had a tabernacle and we had a temple. Now, remember, a tabernacle was like a tent, right? And 
the tabernacle was taken from place to place, right? It was taken down and then put back up. Now the temple, what was the temple made out of? Stone, Stone right? Stone. And it was a permanent structure. But is there a temple in the New Testament? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. I'm glad y'all can read my face. <laughs> right? Yeah, there is a temple in the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, where is the temple? That's not the church. Not at the building, at desert. least. That's not in the desert. In the city? It's not in the city. Jerusalem? It's not in Jerusalem. Right? Where is the temple? Israel? I think somewhere closer. <laughs> it's in us, right? Right. We are the temples of the Lord, right? And who dwells in us? God. Right? right? The Holy Spirit dwells in us, right? And that's one of the things about that we're going to talk about in the passage from Ephesians today. Right? In the Old Testament, God did things in a certain way. Right? And they were temporary. Right? They were a way to teach Israel about what was going to happen when Jesus came. Now, in the New Covenant, right, in the New Testament, right, do we have to go to Jerusalem to worship? No. No, right? We don't have to go to a temple to worship. Right? Where do we have to be to worship God? Church. Not not in church necessarily. Anywhere. We can be anywhere, right? Who do we need to be with? God. Be with God, right? And who else? Jesus. Jesus. Well, Jesus. And who else do we need to be with? People. With people, right? And we need to be with each other, right? The, in the New Testament, wherever God's people are gathered together is where we can worship God. So we don't necessarily have to worship him in this beautiful building, though how many of you would rather worship inside than outside? Right? Worship inside is nice, right? Especially when it's raining and things like that, right? But do we have to be inside to worship God? No. No, right? We worship God wherever God's people are. Because where's the temple now? In it's us. in us, right? And where the Holy Spirit dwells, that's where God is. And so one of the reasons why that's important is not just, you know, because we can worship God anywhere, but it's also a helpful reminder to us as we live our lives as Christians that if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, what does that mean God can see? Us. us, right? And God can see everything that we do, right? And if God is present, do you think we should do what God wants us to do? Yes. That's right, because God not only sees it, but God is present with you, right? So that's an important thing to remember when we think about whether or not we should do what God says or what the world says. Is first of all, that, not, that God can see it, but secondly... God is with you. And what does God want you to do? Worship him. Worship him, right? And obey him. So that's an important thing to remember. And we're going to talk about that some more in uh, the Ephesians passage we read later. But I want you all to, to remember that, okay? All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we who live on this side of the cross, who have received the fullness of Jesus Christ, and who have the, the, the blessing of having the Holy Spirit live within us, to be known by God wherever we are, and that he is present. And that, dear God, we might uh, be reminded that we are comforted in this truth and that we are safe in your hands. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> All right, well, as we re continue to rejoice the Lord in this beautiful house of worship, that we have been blessed with. Uh, we turn now in our uh, red turning hymnal to uh, hymn uh, number 204. Let us stand, let us sing together.
Let us be seated. As we come now in our uh, service of worship this morning uh, to bring the needs of our hearts and our lives and of the Holy Spirit unto the Lord our God, let us do so again as we prepare ourselves uh, to be in His presence. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, the God who has called us by His sovereign grace into this house this morning to be with our brothers and our sisters in Christ, to be with your creation, that we might rejoice in the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ is dead for sinners, that Jesus Christ has bore the wrath due unto us upon his own body and upon his own soul. That, dear God, when you look upon us, you see not our sin, not upon our many transgressions, but you see that wonderful garment of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is wrapped around us. And you see his righteousness given unto us by your gracious gift and grace. Dear God, as we consider your many ways and as we think about your providential hand in our lives, dear God, we pray this morning uh, that your Holy Spirit will remind us uh, once more of the beauty of the gospel, of the bounty that we have received in Jesus Christ. And then, dear God, that you would help our souls to remember daily that we are your covenant children that you have adopted us out of darkness and into the light of your abounding grace, that we live and we move and have our being by your hand, and that in everything we are to give thanks and rejoice. And God, we, help, we ask your help this morning for our wandering hearts and our wandering eyes. For dear God, we confess, even though we have the brightness of your truth in our face, we far too often look back as we plow the field. We go back and, and do those things that you have called us not to do. And we do them because we still love them more than we love you. Dear God, we pray that you would open our eyes to see the futility of sin that you would show us the emptiness once more of a life lived in darkness. Dear God, that you would call unto us from your holy scriptures, dear God. Show us our sin. Show us where we fall short. That we might again once more turn away from the idols. That we might remove the groves from our hearts. And we might be more like our Savior. Jesus Christ, who sought obedience to you and lived a perfect life for our sakes. And dear God, while we know and confess that we will not be perfect in this life, dear God, we ask that we would not take uh, your grace as a license to sin, as an excuse to be babes. But dear God, may we seek to grow in the knowledge of Christ we might take in the weightier matters of the law. We might be weaned off the milk and take in the meat of your word. God, this should be the excitement of our soul. Dear God, we should not have to be poked and prodded to do your work. But it should be the natural outgrowth of a new life in Christ. Dear God, again, we confess our weakness in this regard, our failure in this way. And we lay these things at your feet because we know that you alone are powerful enough to accomplish these things. 
Dear God, may we rest and trust in the strong tower. May we rest and trust in the permanence of your promise and in the knowledge of who we are and what our identity is in Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray in your mercy as we go to your word daily, as we bring the needs of our hearts before you in our morning and evening times of prayer. Dear God, we would not hold anything back that we would openly bear our souls to you. Dear God, we know that you know these things anyway. Let us not be afraid to ask of our Father in heaven. And dear God, we ask that you would open our hearts in these ways, that you would continue to guide us in your power, continue to be with us and watch over us. Dear God, you are our King and our God. Dear God, we ask that you would open each one of our spirits. Help us, dear God. Provide for us in our every need. Dear God, again, we confess that far too often we think only of the material things of this world. We only think of our bank accounts and of the toys that we have. Dear God, may you move our hearts to treasure those things which are above more than the things on this earth. God, we ask these things because we know, again, that you are our God and that we are your people. God, as we pray for these needs of our own hearts this morning, dear God, we lift up unto you our dear sister, Miss Winifred. God, we ask that you would guide her in these hours, dear God. Be uh, with Robert and with Nancy and with their family, dear God. We pray for safe travels unto the, the hospital, dear God. We pray for the doctors and the nurses as they uh, care for Miss Winifred. Pray, dear God, that your uh, will will be done and that she might know your healing, but especially the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit. God, as we pray for Miss Winifred today, dear God, we continue to lift up those of our number who are dealing uh, with physical ailments this morning, who are dealing uh, with recovering from surgery and re recovering from a long-term uh, illness. God, we pray that they might again likewise know the healing power of your Savior. May they know again that you have watched over them even in the darkest of days. And that you are their treasure this morning. We pray, and dear God, for those who are shut in, especially in this time of year. God, we pray for them as they are acutely feeling the pains of loneliness. Dear God, may you encourage us to reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Remind them that they are not alone. That they have in the body of Christ a multitude of brothers and sisters. Dear God, as we continue to pray for these needs, dear God, we also continue to ask your blessings upon our community and upon our nation. Dear God, we pray for our schools and our administrators and teachers and students, dear God. We pray that you would uh, watch over them, especially as they make decisions. Dear God, may you give them wisdom and compassion and understanding. And we especially pray uh, for the closing of uh, this uh, semester and the, and the ending of this portion of the school year. God, we also lift up unto you our college students, dear God, who, who, who have uh, completed uh, their semesters. We pray that you would give them uh, a time of rest and uh, recuperation and relaxation. Prepare them, dear God, uh, for the semester uh, that is to come. Dear God, we pray in your mercy uh, at this time of year, dear God, uh, that you'll watch over all those who are traveling and uh, those who are considering traveling. Dear God, we pray that you would be with them. Continue to focus our hearts and our minds upon uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For he truly is our peace and our comfort every moment of the year. Dear God, we ask your blessings upon each of these things. Dear God, as we raise up our Ebenezer and our thanksgivings unto heaven. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand now as we turn uh, to our sermon text today, Ephesians chapter 2, as we come to read the word of the Lord. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, 
We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for your providential timing and bringing these words to us on this day. We pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will help us and guide us through your spirit. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. One of the patterns of the Old Testament is this separation that exists between the sons of God and the daughters of men. We see it happen almost immediately after the sin of Adam in the garden. We hear of the births of Cain and Abel. And we know from Cain and Abel that there was enmity between the brothers. In fact, it grew into murder. We know that Abel's blood called out from the ground, and we know that Cain was sent out from east of Eden. And a mark was put on him. And of course we know that the mark was not only to separate him from the godly line, but also it was an act of mercy of God. Because remember, what was not allowed to happen to Cain? Right? Cain was not allowed to be killed. Right? He was separate from the Lord. And again, we don't usually think of that, that as an act of mercy, but that is, in fact, a sign from God of that which was to come in the future. But of course, what happens to the line of Cain? We see in the early chapters of Genesis that the wickedness of that line grows and grows and grows. In fact, the first man in the Bible to be a polygamist that is a man married to more than one wife, which is, of course, against the teachings of Holy Scripture and the witness of the Bible, was one of the sons of Cain. In fact, then we come to the birth of Seth, right? The sign, the symbol of the promised seed of God promised unto Eve. And then we're told that what happened between the sons of God, that is the sons of Seth, and the daughters of of men, that is the daughters of Cain, they began to intermarry. And what happened when they began to intermarry? Well, the godly line became wicked, eventually leading to the days of Noah. And then what happens in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, there is a flood which comes down and wipes off the face of the earth everyone but Noah and his family. And then what happens after Noah and his family come off the ark? Well, we have a division between the sons of Noah. Right? We have the godly line, which comes down through Shem, and we have Japheth, and we have Ham. And of course, we're told that the line of Ham is cursed because of his wickedness with Noah. And so we see this separation happen again after the days of Noah. We have the godly line that comes through Shem, which eventually is, is marked out as the people of Abraham. And then we have everyone else, right? The Gentiles of the Old Covenant. And what Paul is declaring in Ephesians chapter 2 is that these two peoples, the sons of Abraham and the sons of Cain, are now brought back together as one body. Now, what's important about that? Why does that matter 
that these two lives are now made one again. Well, notice what Paul says at the beginning of the passage we just read. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Well, what separated the Jews from the Gentiles? One of the things that Paul has mentioned in the verses we've looked at before is that circumcision was the sign that separated the Jews from the Gentiles. And that sign of circumcision was an outward sign that one was in covenant with God and the other was in covenant with the people in Israel. And all of these things are taking place in order that there might be a clear testimony of what it meant to be a child of God and what it meant to be a child of Satan. That one was blessed and one was cursed. Now that separation does continue in the New Testament. But what is the sign that separates the ungodly from the godly? Well, in the New Testament, that sign is baptism, right? The outward sign that separates. And what makes that, again, different? It's not based upon an ethnic reality, right? It's not based upon who your parents are. It's not based upon what your skin color is. It's not based upon what region of the world you come from. It is based upon the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is that testimony that Paul wants to make clear to the Jews and Gentiles at Ephesus, that they are not to treat one another as different based upon outward realities, but based on what was within them. That they were to separate themselves from the world and that they were to be united together as one in the church and based upon their common baptism, their common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this wasn't just a problem at Ephesus, right? This fight between Jews and Gentiles. It was also a problem at Galatia. In Galatia, there was this, again, this discussion, if you want to put it lightly, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Did the Gentiles have to become Jews first in order to go to heaven? Did they need to be circumcised? Did they need to follow the old covenant regulations regarding the temple? Right? Did they have to keep kosher? Or is that not necessary? And Paul, in dealing with that, gives us a word picture in Galatians chapter 4 that talks about Hagar and talks about Sarah. And in that testimony, we're told about these two mountains. And one, again, is Hagar. And remember, who was Hagar? Hagar was the concubine of Abraham who produced Ishmael. And Sarah, of course, is the mother of Isaac. And in that word picture, the purpose of Paul there is to declare again what makes you a child of Abraham and what makes you a child of Hagar. What makes you a child of Abraham is not the keeping of kosher. It's not the outward sign of circumcision, but what? Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but what does avail? What does bring forth blessing? The new creation. And what is the new creation? The new creation is what Paul talks about here in verse 14. That Jesus Christ, who is our peace, has made both one. And he has taken circumcision and uncircumcision and united them together in one body. Again, notice what marks out that one body. It is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the primary picture that Paul uses to describe this. It is peace. Well, what is peace? Right? Peace is not just the absence of war. Right? Peace is not just the fact that nobody's shooting at each other. Right? Peace, in, in a biblical sense, is an assurance. It's a comfort. It's a knowledge that lacks fear of the unknown. 
Right? This peace that Jesus Christ has presented unto his covenant people is the knowledge that they are not only safe in Jesus, but that they have everything that they need in Jesus. Because remember, what's one of the things that the Jews were trying to force upon the people? Again, it wasn't just the keeping of kosher. It was this idea that the true heirs to Abraham were Jews and that the Gentiles were interlopers, that they were kind of second, secondary citizens, that there was a separate but equal attitude within the new covenant. And Paul is doing everything he can to get rid of this kind of thinking, that there is no hierarchy within the kingdom, that there is no idea that one Christian is better than another Christian based on anything of themselves. What is he saying in Galatians 3.28? That there are neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, but are all one in Christ Jesus. And again, that identity that we have that is based upon what Jesus Christ has done for us and what Jesus Christ has placed upon us again changes not only how we treat one another, but how we see one another. And that's a danger, not just in Ephesus and Galatia, but it's a danger in 21st century Clover, South Carolina. We have a tendency to think as the world thinks when it comes to these particular things, to think because of our stature or because of who we are, that we are more important than other Christians. Now that may work itself out differently in different situations, but Paul here, in dealing with this, is calling it for what it is. It's sin to act as if one Christian is better than another or more important than another. And one of the ways this worked itself out in the churches in Asia, as well as in Palestine, is spoken of by the Apostle James. James there talks about the fact that when a rich man came into the uh, meeting place into the synagogue where they're meeting. How did everyone react when the rich man came in? Right, they stood up. Right, they showed him honor. They gave him the best seat. And of course, you know, somewhat differently to us, the best seat in the house was down front. Right, if rich man came in, we'd probably give him the back pew. Right, that's the the best seat. Right, the idea was again the problem that they gave honor to this man for his outward appearance. But what happened in the book of James when the poor man came in the house, right, came into the meeting place? And people shunned their eyes. Right? They, they made room for him, but they did not acknowledge him. And then James makes it clear that that is wicked to act in that way. But isn't that the natural activity of the heart, to give honor to those who appear as if they deserve honor, based on outward appearance? The Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews tells us that some come into the church and we entertain them and what sometimes do we not know? Right? Sometimes we are entertaining angels. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important for the church not to act outwardly towards others, but to look again at the true sign of a believer. And right? it's not circumcision, it's not outward matters, but it's the nature of the heart. And right? it's the beauty of what we are our identity in Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and who has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now, this word picture would have immediately made sense to every Jew who heard it. Because what was the middle wall of separation? Right? He's not referring to here the, uh, the veil of the curtain that was between the Holy of Holies and the outward part of the temple. What he's talking about here is the wall in the temple which separated the Gentiles from the Jews. Remember in, in the temple, not only was there a wall separating Gentiles and Jews, but there was a court of men and a court of women. Right? Even men and women were not allowed to mix in the temple court. And there were certain places that even Jews weren't allowed to go, right? You know, even if you were the most godliest Jew, if you're not a priest, what are you not allowed to do? Right? You just can't walk up there and throw your own sacrifice on the fire. Right? What happens to people who do that in the Old Testament? 
Right? King Uzziah tries to do that, and he gets leprosy. But we look at that and we say, well, he was just trying to you know, worship God. And why is God so mean to him? Well, first of all, uh, we can't just do whatever we feel like, right? We do what God calls us to do. And it was not the job of the king to go and sacrifice. Likewise, with the sons of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Moses' uh, brother Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, when they offered up strange fire to the Lord, what happened? They were consumed by the fire. And again, they were doing what they thought was right, right? It wasn't the fact they were worshiping Baal, right? They just offered fire that God had not commanded. And God brought down his judgment upon them for that reason. Again, there was a separation in the Old Covenant based upon God's revealed word and the testimony of his calling and the testimony of his calling in old, on the old covenant, again, was not because he was mean. But all of these things were for a purpose, right? This middle wall served a reason under the old covenant that we are to learn from. And we are to learn that there is a difference between those inside the camp and those outside the camp. But again, in the new covenant, it's not based upon these outward realities, right? This middle wall of separation has been taken down. Right, the difference that Paul wants them to understand, again, is in verse 16. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Again, what is this difference that still exists? Right? It's not this Gentile Jew difference. It's not male and female. It's not based on any of these outward characteristics. Right? It's based upon this peace that we have received in Jesus Christ. Right? This knowledge of faith that we have in him that God has gifted and granted unto us by the eternal promise of Jesus Christ. Right? We who have been washed in the blood, we who have been made new creatures, we have been set apart from the world. And how then should we live? We don't live in accordance with the old covenant ceremonies. We're allowed to eat bacon now. Praise the Lord. We're allowed to eat shellfish now. Praise the Lord. We're allowed to wear mixed fabric clothing now. Praise the Lord. Right? I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us here today have mixed fabric clothing on of some kind or another. Right? And again, that was against the law and the old covenant. Again, what was the purpose of that? Again, it wasn't just God being willy-nilly in his lawmaking. Right? It was to teach Israel that they were to be separate from the world. And so again, these outward separations have been taken away. The way we are set from the world in the new covenant is by our obedience to Jesus Christ. Right? The way we are set apart from the world around us is not by what we wear, but how we behave, what we value, what we love, what we understand to be right and wrong. And of course, there's a sense in which that also existed in the old covenant. Israel was to be different from the nations around it, not just because of how they dressed, but because of who they devoted their lives to. And it's worth remembering that sin in the Old Testament is the same as sin as in the New Testament. How was sin understood in the Old Testament? Was it just the outward breaking of the law, or was it also the sin committed with the heart? In Sabbath school this morning, we read from the prophet Isaiah, and he spoke about the fact that Israel had committed sin against the Lord, not only in deed, but also in tongue. And what does Jesus Christ say about the tongue? Right? It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out. Right? The book of Proverbs is filled with examples of the tongue being the truth teller of who we really are inside. And that's one of the reasons why both the Old and the New Covenants speak of the circumcision of the heart that is necessary for believers. Because on the day of judgment, when we're standing before the Lord Jesus Christ, 
What is he going to look and see when he looks at us? Is he going to see whether or not we are outwardly circumcised? Is he going to see whether or not our names are written down in the church register at Bethany? Now, the apostle Peter on the day of judgment is not going to go around to every church in the world, gather up the books that sit in my study upstairs and see whether or not your name's written down. Right? That's not how it's going to work. And unfortunately, far too many people think that's how it's going to work. Right? They worry more about their name being on a book upstairs than they worry about their own place in his kingdom. Right? They think as long as their name's written down on a, a sheet of paper somewhere that they laid claim to Jesus when they were 12 or whenever that they are going to go to heaven. But that's not how the Lord Jesus Christ works. That's not how Judgment Day is going to work. And that's one of the things that Paul is laying out here in the book of Ephesians, in the passage that we've looked to. Again, what is our peace? Our peace is not being a Jew or a Gentile. Our peace is being found in Jesus Christ. Our peace is being numbered amongst his sheep. And again, that's one of the reasons why Paul is so focused on the mechanics of how we come to faith in the opening chapters of the book of Ephesians. Because he wants to drive home the point that we are saved by faith alone. That we are saved by our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are saved by the shed blood of the Lamb for our sins. We're not saved by how many times we go to the temple and sacrifice sheep. We're not saved by our outward obedience to the law. Because that's another thing going on here in the passage. In verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Remember, what were the Pharisees so concerned about when it came to Jesus? They were so concerned about his outward obedience to the man-made commandments. They were worried about the fact that he didn't wash his hands before he ate. They were worried about him healing men and women on the Sabbath. They were worried about him doing all these things that they understood to be righteous. How many times in uh, the church do we concern ourselves with the outward things of the law rather than with the weightier matters, the commandments that God has revealed unto us. How often do we concern ourselves with things that are not a part of God's commandments? And we judge people based on whether or not they keep these outward things rather than on the more important matters of the heart. Now that's not to say that we can never judge outwardly there are outward ways to see whether or not somebody truly places their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Somebody can say they believe in Jesus, but if they never worship him, what does that show us? What does that tell us? It tells us that they're not really concerned about Jesus. Right? They want that get out of hell free card, but they really don't appreciate what that means. They don't understand the nature of what they received in Jesus Christ. Likewise, if somebody is actively living in open sin against the Lord and they're not bothered by it, what does that tell us about the heart? Right, when Jesus confronted the woman at the well with the fact that she had had seven, eight husbands and in fact the man that she was living with then wasn't her husband, what did she do when Jesus confronted her with that fact? Right? Did she try to talk her way out of it? No, in fact, what we see from the woman at the well is she goes and tells her friends and family about this man who told her of everything that she had ever done. And while her faith is not perfectly formed, again, why should we expect it to be? We see the excitement in her spirit as she speaks to others of Christ. So again, the, the, the nature of what Paul is laying out here, again, is not that we can never judge. Right? What does Jesus say in John 7, 24? That we are to judge with a righteous judgment. 
We are to judge by the commandments that have been revealed to us in Holy Scripture, not by man-made commandments, not by man-made principles, not by the way things have always been done, not by outward means, but only by that which gives us peace and that which is contained in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, as we hear these words from Paul this morning and as we are reminded about this fact that being a son or a daughter of a founding member of Bethany is not what gets us into heaven. Right? Being a son and daughter of faithful parents is not what gets us into heaven. Right? We don't believe in residual holiness. Right? We don't believe that you can get into heaven based on someone else's good works. Now, there are religions out there that teach that, right? That, that you can go light a candle right now for your dear departed grandmother and get them out of purgatory. That you can give money to the construction of the, uh, the, the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and you can help out uh, your dear departed loved one. But is that the, what the Bible teaches about how righteousness works? That our holiness works? About how any of this works? The Apostle Paul is, is driving home this reality that our only hope is in Jesus. Our only peace and comfort is in the one who has removed all of these outward things and left us with the pure inward work of his Holy Spirit. And in Colossae, again, similar problems are going on. And as, as Paul is, is preaching to the people of Colossae, he says there in verse 11, In him, that is in Jesus, you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Well, the obvious thing is there, what about the circumcision made with hands? Right? Without getting too gross, right? We, we you know, know what circumcision is, right? It's made with hands. Right? And of course, in the New Covenant, there's no requirement to have that done. But the reality is that the Jews understood that to be sufficient for salvation. They understood that that's what mattered, right? The outward testimony. But what really truly matters when it comes to the Christian faith? It is this circumcision made without hands, right? The putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Being buried with him in baptism... And being raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Again, why do we worship on Sunday? Right? It's not a random thing that the early church decided would work better. Right? It's not an act of pragmatism. We worship on Sunday because this is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And we worship on the first day of the week because on the new covenant... Right, The Sabbath has moved from the seventh day to the first day. And why has the Sabbath moved? Well, first of all, only Jesus can do that. Right? The principle is the same, one day and seven. But in the old covenant, what were you doing? You were looking forward to the coming of Christ. Right? You were looking forward to the end of the week, right? to the future promise of God. And we meet on the first day of the week because what do we do? Right? We are living in the day of the new covenant in the last days, as it were, and we are working forward to the day when Christ will return. At right? the beginning of our week, beginning of our life, the first day of the week is this remembrance that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It's one of the reasons why we uh, traditionally, Presbyterians always talked about Sunday, the Lord's Day, the Sabbath day, being Christmas and Easter all in one. Right? Every week is this holy day where we remember not only the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, we remember his death and we remember his resurrection from the dead. Well, we meet early in the morning because Christ rose in the morning. Right? And we worship with this view towards heaven and towards the, the goodness that we received in Jesus Christ. Again, the, the nature of this work is a change that has taken place in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. 
As he says there in the closing verse, verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Again, the Holy Spirit which dwells within us, who has cleansed us of all sin, cleansed us of all unrighteousness, who has given us new life, who has made us new creatures, has given us access to our Heavenly Father. Again, remember the old covenant. How did you gain access to God? Through the high priest. And how many times a year did the high priest get access to God? One day a year, he got to go in the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Now we are going to talk about the veil that was torn in the temple, right? That happens in the day that Jesus Christ died when, when, when the darkness comes upon the earth. The veil is torn. And what do we now have access to in the new covenant? We have access to our Father because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Because as I shared with the children, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And if we are temples of the Holy Spirit, how then should we live? Right? If we are united to Christ by faith, if we have been received these things, and if we think back to what the Holy of Holies represents, right? It's the holiest place in all of Israel. It's where God dwells. And what happened to the priests who didn't go in there right? Remember, what, what were they supposed to do with the great high priest before he went into the Holy of Holies? They were supposed to tie a rope around his foot. And why did they do that? Well, what happens to a body when it dies and is left there? It starts to smell a little bit, doesn't it? Well, if the, Holy, if the high priest went in there and he did something wrong and God struck him dead, they needed to be able to pull him out. Because what happened if they would just saunter into the Holy of Holies to try to get the body? I don't think God would look too kindly on that, and they'd ended up in the same position. And so they would pull out the high priest by his leg. And again, that's just not an example of God being mean, right? God being judgy or whatever. But it's a reminder of the holiness of our God. It's a reminder that our God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so in closing this morning, the, the, the reminder of this at the end of the passage is again once more to, to, to encourage the believers at Ephesus as well as the believers at Bethany and wherever God's people might be gathered this morning that there is an expectation upon those who have received the circumcision made without hands. That if you are going to have the Holy Spirit within you, how ought you to live? As one who knows that the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. You should live as one who loves the Lord their God. Who cannot stand but do that which is right and that which is holy. And again, we do those things not in order that we might gain entrance to heaven, but because of a reaction to what Christ has done for us. Again, it's an act of joy in our hearts when we are obedient to the Lord. First, the, the fruits of our faith are necessary. Because again, what does James say also in his letter? That faith without works is dead. And what good is a dead faith? Will a dead faith get you into heaven? Will a faith made by the hands of men get you into heaven? What's the only way to get into heaven? By having a faith that is lively. A faith that exhibits the nature of our understanding that we belong unto a holy God. And that holy God has called us to live in holiness and in righteousness. And if we who have become dead to the law, to the body of Christ, may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, and we have been raised from the dead with Jesus Christ, we should bear the fruit of God. Because it's not us doing it, is it? No, it's the Holy Spirit living within us that does it. And that's what true peace is. That's what true comfort is. That's what true happiness is. Is seeing the beauty of Christ in everything. And especially seeing the beauty of Christ in being obedient unto his word. And so as we uh, leave here today, and as we think about 
You know, what Paul is, is teaching us, what he's proclaiming to us in the word of God today. And let us be careful as we leave this place that our faith not be in ourselves. Let it not be in the testimony of our lips. Let it not be in the circumcision made with hands. Let our faith be in the eternal promise that we received in Jesus Christ. That in him we move and have our being. And that in him we have our righteousness and the new life promised from above. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that you have called us once more to serve you in every way. And that, dear God, we are called to make our calling and election sure. In a word of assurance unto us, we are to be reminded that our salvation is not based on us, but on Christ and upon his gift and that gift of faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 214. Let us stand and sing together. chapter 6, uh, verses 40 through 42. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, my God, I pray that your ears be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength, let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. And let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. Amen. Please be seated. Like I said, we'll take it. Couple minutes just to get organized and everything, and then we will. Uh...